And our topic tonight is the dynamics of a long marriage. You notice uh, we didn't say a long happy marriage or a long successful marriage. We just said a long marriage. When I put the screen up, I thought about, you know how you stretch a word? I thought about just putting a lot of O's in the word long. Long marriage. Because <clears throat> sometimes marriage can feel awfully long. And you're just kind of in it for the endurance race that it provides. <clears throat> the truth is, the truth is marriage is a, a surprisingly combative. When we get married, we, we love, you know, the wedding ceremony has words like love and descriptions of love. And, uh, and we have passion and romance and sexual desire and intimate feelings and all those things are driving us crazy and hormones are going crazy and we're usually young, not always, second, third marriages we're not usually, but all of those things happen and we get married thinking it's going to be euphoria and this is the love of my life and we got so much chemistry together and it's my soulmate and then after a little while you find out that you're kind of in a, 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 an arena of combat. It, I don't mean that like, oh, it's wrong. I mean, that's really what happens. It's really two people opposed to each other. Hardly anybody marries, and they just never have a struggle either way. Oh, whatever you like, honey, whatever you like. I have no will. I have no wish. I have no personality except to please you. Eh, that doesn't happen. And uh, so there are actually... Now, when I say a long marriage, uh, here's, here's the point to the title. I assume when we marry that all of us really mean the vow part that says, till death do us part. So we think we're going to stay married to that person forever, you know, at least until death separates us. <clears throat> and, uh, and we really think it's going to be easy. We think we mean it. We have so much lovey-dovey stuff and so much arousal and stimulation, and oh my gosh, can't hold her enough, can't hold him enough. So we really think it's going to be great, uh, and that's how, that's how we'll last a long time. But we discover uh, several things about marriage in stages through the marriage. And I have six uh, stages, six different dynamics that change us, affect us, that we have to learn to deal with through uh, a marriage, however long a marriage takes, all the way to the end. I might get through all six tonight, uh, probably won't, might get through three tonight, might get through all six. I'm going to try to watch the clock over here, but I forget sometimes, so I'm going to try to watch the clock. And we're going to walk through each of those six dynamic changes of marriage. And the first one is simply the dynamic of discovery. <clears throat> Here's what happens shortly after we marry. We start discovering what kind of person we married. We did not know until we married. Nobody knows in the dating process who you're marrying. You've been married for four or five months, you're pretty much waking up to a stranger after a few months because you find out that you may still love them and you may love their quirkiness and their ideas and some of the things they do and the way they treat you and make you feel. But there are so many discoveries that we start making after we are bound together by marriage. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, in favor of, uh, I'm not in favor of premarital sex. I think the Bible is c uh, pretty clear about that. I'm not in favor of people living together before they get married. We're going to try it out. That's just uh, fornication. That's also not condoned in the Bible. So no, no, no criticism and insult, man. I'm just telling you that those are, if, if you're just living together, that's still not a marriage. I don't know why. This is a male point of view, but I don't know why a woman would live with a man who want to ask her to marry and commit to a life together because if a man gets a woman to live with him for a while on a test run, uh, he's just enjoying no commitments because basically what he wanted was sex and uh, somebody to wash his clothes if she does, uh, maybe cook now and then if she does. 
or at least to just hang with in front of his buds. If uh, she's pretty, he thinks she's just a piece of jewelry on his arm because that's not, that's not marriage. It doesn't matter how many ways you describe it and how comfortable you feel with it. It's still not marriage because marriage is a contract. Uh, you could describe marriage as a contract. Uh, I'll give you some C words. A contract, a commitment, uh, a conflict. Uh, that's what marriage is, but it starts with that contract, that contract that says the vow, that says, okay, you're the one. I don't want another. There's not another. You're the one till death do us part. And when you make that contract, that marriage, that vow, you're committing to that person for better or worse, for richer or poorer, for up or down, wide or narrow, success or failure, money or broke, you're committing to that person, good health, bad health. Uh, that's what marriage is. It's a commitment. It's a contract. It's a conflict. It's a consensus sometimes. <clears throat> but, uh, but I started this by uh, saying that marriage is sort of a, a combat, uh, and, it, and, and I'll come back to that. We'll call it conflict. That sounds better than combat. Marriage is a conflict. It's a conflict of two people, different personalities, uh, usually different goals and ideals, but we lie about those things in the dating process. I don't care how good a Christian you are, man or woman, boy or girl, none of us are really interested in revealing exactly what kind of person we are to the person we're dating and thinking we might want to marry. We just don't. We pat ourselves on the back and say we do, but we just don't. Uh, we are nervous about this person when we're dating and thinking this might be the one. We're nervous about them. We're not sure that they feel the same way about us. We feel about them. We feel, especially men, feel this need to woo, to win them over. Uh, uh, all, uh, all respect to both male and female sexes. I am a man, and I'll make some men uh, irritated uh, when I say this, uh, because some men right now, when I say it, you're going to say, oh, my wife's a bigger liar than I am. The comment I want to make is I think men are much better liars than women in the dating process. I think there's a reason for that. I think when you're dating someone that you think you might marry, men feel the need. Uh, there's just this uh, inborn concept of um, I'm the provider I'm the strong one. I, I, I got to convince her that I can take care of her, whether she wants to be taken care of or not. That's, that's not in his mind. His mind is, I got to convince her I can make money. I can protect her. I can, I can be successful. But if I'm not right now, how does she know I'm going to be? And so men will kind of make up a character that they might not really be. They, they will kind of say things that they might not even weigh out much, but it's all designed to make her impressed with uh, who I am. Sometimes it's very honest. Sometimes the man uh, wants to be that person, but he's not quite there yet, but he still creates that persona about himself. And the, the reason I, I say this is because uh, sometimes when a, a couple gets married, uh, they're both a little shocked after a few months about some of the things this other person does and some of their habits and some of their concepts of people and the way they treat certain people and, and their family. You didn't know the family very well at all. And, you, you know, it's nice to say, I didn't marry the family. I'm just marrying you. Uh, no, you married the family. Better or worse, like it or not, you'll always be somehow connected to that family. And whether you're proud of them or ashamed of them, it doesn't make any difference. You're in that clan. And you have to be out of respect for your spouse because the spouse is commanded by God to honor the father and mother, even if they're not honorable, as long as you live. Honor doesn't say anything about the parent. Honor says something about the person choosing to give honor to the parent. And so there we are. So when I put this up about discovery, there are two things, uh, uh, there are two aspects of this. The first is uh, you're discovering the person you actually married. That's the one. And then the other one is you're discovering who you really are. Because whether you felt like you lied or not, maybe you didn't lie much, but you still don't really know who you are until you're thrown into the arena of conflict 
with a person that you believe you cared for. And all of a sudden, that person doesn't seem to have the same qualities you thought they had, and they want to go left when you want to go right. And how are you going to win this? Will you lose? Will you win? Why do you even have to win? Why don't they just cave in? Why don't they see your point of view? You didn't know they were that stupid, that dumb. How can this be? <clears throat> You're not really discovering them at that point. You're discovering who you really are. You're learning under the pressure of fire how you respond to crisis. You're learning how you respond to criticism. You're learning how you respond to conflict. You're learning how you respond to someone who doesn't get along with you. They might not like you as much as they did a little while ago. When my generation, when I was young and getting married and coming up, there was a kind of a general rule of thought, and I can't remember. Somebody probably wrote this book and used this phrase, but it was a common thing bandied about by counselors and marriage counselors and even ministers would say, would refer to the seven-year itch. I think there was a movie by that, but I honestly think the movie was based on a, uh, like a psychologist or a counselor, somebody who came up with that. Because the idea behind it, and it was taught fairly often in my young days, was that the, uh, the typical couple uh, got married and found out they were in conflict with a lot of things, but if they could just make it to the seventh year that was kind of a magic number. If they could just make it seven years, then they'd probably last for the rest of the life. But in the generation that we came up in, seven years was not an unheard of number for somebody to wait till they had kids. They'd get married sometimes right out of high school, or 18 years old, and they might not have a kid until they were 24, 23. Uh, they would, you know, birth control had become acceptable by in the early days of my generation. And so it wasn't my mother's generation, but in mine it was. And so uh, families were planning, you know, we all wanted to plan our families. Uh, we don't want a child right now. We can't afford it. We're not where we want to be in jobs. We don't, we're not in the house we want to be in. But if we get this job and that job, three years from now, we can have the down payment for us. And then we'll get pregnant and have a child. And so that means you might have five to seven years of just the two of you, and if you survive that, you're going to make it. But I'm, uh, this generation, I'm telling you, is not like that generation. They don't rush out of high school and get married. Sometimes they live together before they get married, which is, a, I will say again for the camera, it's a mistake. It's a mistake for the relationship that you're in. And it doesn't build trust. It actually builds just the opposite of trust. And a man will come in a several years when he's having those conflicts and some men are flirting with his now prettier wife and even more successful because she's got some of your money to spend and buys her clothes with your money. And some men are flirting with her. Uh, I have watched men become so outrageously jealous because they didn't trust their wife. And they would literally say, after all, you moved in with me against your father's wishes and he didn't want you to, and you came in with me, what's to keep you from moving in with somebody else? And so it doesn't build a marriage. It actually uh, can cripple the concept of what the marriage is all about. And it doesn't mean if a couples have, you know, they make mistakes, they go too far, they apologize, they, they say, look, let's not do that. That's a totally different thing. Anytime we make mistakes and we ask forgiveness or we apologize, move on, that's a growth and learning experience. <laughs> but to just pretend that no scripture exists about it and God's blind to us and he doesn't care because we love each other and that's all that matters, that is not all that matters. Marriage is a contract for a good reason. When Christ talked about two being joined together, he said, let no man separate them. Let no man divide this union of these two people asunder. None whatsoever. This must always last. And so that's, that's what we start discovering. It's not a seven-year plan, by the way. It's a, it can sometimes be a one-year plan. And I don't want to get into number two dynamic yet. Let me finish a couple of things about this discovery. If a couple gets married and, the, and, and, and after they've been married a few months, they really feel like uh, they don't know this person very well. They never saw that reaction before when they were dating. They never heard that language before. They found out you lied about the money you had or your family had or what we were going to do. Didn't even tell the truth about your job opportunities. 
And, uh, and it's easy to start thinking, I made a mistake, I married a creep, I married the wrong person, they were just deceivers. In defense of liars and deceivers, I, I, that's not a good way to say that, but in defense of liars and deceivers, let me tell you that sometimes the reason we lie, even though it's wrong to lie, the reason we do uh, is, is innocent in a way. It is because uh, I will speak as a man. If I'm, in, if I'm trying to get a woman to say yes, if I'm trying to get engaged to a woman that I don't think I deserve, if I think she's above me, she's beyond me, she's out of my league, She'll never say yes to me. I can't measure up. Her dad is rich. Her dad is successful. Her dad's famous. Her dad's powerful. I'm a nobody. My family are nobodies. We're just poor people. And there's no way she'll ever say yes to me. Unless, unless I create a persona that kind of goes along with her life and her family. And if I tell her, you know, I'm just working here right now, but I've already got lines for, ah. And sometimes, as silly as that is, the motive is really a compliment to the person you're trying to get, because not, and a, not a compliment, but you get the idea. I don't deserve this person, but the only way I could get this person would be not to be me, to be somebody a little bit better than me. Well, you can't be better, so you just fabricate your money, your job, your clout, your success, your plans, your dreams. And then after you get married, you find out you're broke still. You can't manufacture money. It doesn't grow on trees. You can't, your personality is what it is, and it's hard to change it. And, and all of a sudden, you're commuting in one car, and your spouse gets to see whether you have road rage or not. And uh, you find out that... Even after you get married, the telephone occupies more time than you do. They don't have a conversation. They're always talking to somebody. I'm just my girlfriends. I got to talk to them. It's my guys. Okay. And you spend a few years second guessing yourself. For lack of a better term, we'll say you get buyer's remorse. In marriage, we sometimes get buyer's remorse. And, uh, and a lot of people justify, uh, you know, we gave it three years and pastor, it's just not right and it's not ever going to work. And, uh, and we justify it because he lied to me. He, he, he made me think he had and his family had, and that is often true, but it's quite often not a reason to divorce. The better solution is in that period of discovery in the first years of our marriage, in that period of discovery, we should try to give, Paul gave us a definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, best definition probably in the scripture. Uh, love is defined in that chapter. And Paul says things like, uh, love bears all things, love endures all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, uh, love never fails. And so using the definitions and the language the apostle Paul gave us, it's easy for me to say, I know what she meant. I know what he meant. What he meant was that's the person he wants to be. It may not be the person he is right now, but he wants to be there. I know the kind of job he had liked to have because we talked about it. I didn't know he had this kind of job. I know. And if, and if we truly love the person when we marry and we fit the definition of love, we're able to go back and say, I can bear this, I can endure this, I can get past this, because I saw a peek into the heart of the person in those days we were dating and getting engaged, even though some of that has changed in our actual marriage. I will confess for a moment that I probably was the best liar and fabricator. Maybe that's a better word. I'm I don't want to be a liar going to hell. All liars have their part in the leg of fire. I don't know if that verse applies to fabricators. I think there might be a difference in a fabricator because I could take a dream and a hope and fabricate a whole plan that that's going to work, even though deep down inside I knew <laughs> I'm never going to get the job that I would have to have to get there and do that. But, you know, if we drive past that neighborhood and I say, one day we're going to live here, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we're, no, we're not. We never have, and we never will. We've been 50 years going now, 
and we'll never live in that house over there in that neighborhood. So she finally accepted he's just a fabricator of dreams and ideas. And, uh, and, and, and I saw uh, certain things about my wife as well that, you know, she wanted to put a good front for me and a good impression. And, and you know, it was all about being Christian and faithful and faithful to a husband and you're just wonderful and you're just whatever. And then after you get married, you still have those feelings for each other, but you don't know how many little things can drive you insane about that person. I will tell you, how small of things got me and my wife arguing in the first few months of our marriage. Number one, when you put a toilet paper roll on the toilet paper thing, do you hang the flap on the back or over the front? Now, there is a right way to do it. I happen to know the right way. She did not. I don't even care that 15 years after we'd been married, I just caved in and did it her way, and we still do it her way today because I like it better than I did the stupid way I argued for it in the early days. I literally argued for a way that I don't even like now, and I wouldn't hang a roll of toilet paper that way now. I'm not going to tell you which one because I don't want to shatter your dreams, and uh, you're trying to convince your bride or husband to be that you, know, you're, you, you got it figured out. Uh, problem number two. Uh, toothpaste tubes. In those days, they were all tubes, not bottles you squeeze. Everything was a tube. You rolled up the end, squeeze more out. Uh, I, I had worked in engineering. That's what I was doing. I was a draftsman. I loved drafting. I loved designing machinery, working on wonderful. I had, I had some really good jobs, and they were all engineering. You know, everything has to be precisely machined and measured, and I drew enormously complicated machinery that would separate uh, peas and cashews and peanuts and rocks and drill holes to plant dynamite charges in mines and I could draw the entire machine and then I come home and, and everything needs to be in its place in its order and that drawer this goes there and when you squeeze the toothpaste you squeeze from the end and when you get far enough up, you roll that end. Back in those days, they were nearly all aluminum instead of plastic. And you roll it. You do not just grab the cotton picking tube and squeeze it with your hand and then throw the lumpy thing back on the counter, not straight, clean, and rolled up and pressed from the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, one man said amen in case, you know, you can't see the crowd on the camera. So one man God bless you, and you're probably not happily married either. But that's all right. <laughs> we know the right way to squeeze toothpaste. That's really all that matters. Number three, I learned the hard way. Apparently, women expect you, if there's a little button on your shower in the bathroom and you have a tub shower, apparently you have to go over and press the button down when you're through showering because the woman coming in later cannot look down and see the button up and push it before she turns the water on. She just leans over and pulls the water thing out and gets blasted from the back of the head because she was too dumb to realize the button was up. Reach over, push the stinking button down before you pull the water. Only that's not the way it works. I have 49 and a half years of practice. I never leave the tub, if there's a tub, without pushing that button down so that it will never come out of the, the shower head until she decides it will come out of the shower head. Okay, I, I, I concede that it makes sense to push the button for the next person coming in, I guess. Kind of the same thing on lifting a toilet seat. Men don't have to sit down at night when they get out of bed to go to the bathroom. I'm sorry you ladies do, men don't. And so we can lift the lid and do our business. If you're too lazy to pull the lid back down before you sit down on it, and if you fall into a porcelain bowl that didn't have the expected cover around there to keep you from falling in, you'd think once you fall in the bowl, you learn. From now on, pull the thing down. But you don't. And it becomes an eternal conflict until finally somebody caves and says, all right, dear, I will put the seat down or I'll just learn to sit for the rest of my life. It's too complicated for you. I'll just sit instead of standing. Call me a lady, but I'm just not going to fight anymore about it. 
and so on and so forth. And I, it's simple and it's silly and it's small, but it is the point I'm trying to make about the first dynamic of marriage really is not just learning how big something minor can be to your spouse, it's how big it can be to you too. Because as much as I had my adamant way, let me just tell you, Miss You-Know-Who, I ain't calling any names, was just as adamant that she was right about the toilet paper for Pete's sake. Don't blame that all on me. Two young people and nobody wanting to lose the lamest and dumbest argument ever. And that's, that's a discovery. <laughs> when you discover the person that you love and the dream and the love of your life and your soulmate can argue to your face over a toothpaste tube. Are we on camera still? There's no way to pause that. And still, after 50 years, some stupidly small things matter a great deal. But you know what you do learn after those first few years of that discovery? It doesn't matter anymore. You can get bent out of shape over the smallest thing. Guess who's not going to get in the fight with you about it? Me. And neither is she. We had not had a fight in so long now, we make up reasons to fight now and then. Sometimes we'll just be going to dinner and uh, driving to a restaurant, and I would just slam on the brake to make her holler and say, what are you doing? What is wrong with you? I nearly hit my head on the... And then, and then I want to fight. I say, we had had an argument in a long time. What are you going to do about it? I slam the brakes on. Here, there's another one. How's that one? And then instead of fighting, it's just like, look out the window. Oh, my God, you're so dumb. And I don't care. It's not a fight. Because we ended that by surviving the years of discovery when you really do discover this is not the person I'm married, not the person I thought I was going to marry. He doesn't manage money like I thought he did. She doesn't take care of the checkbook. She doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. I don't, I can't believe. Are you kidding me? I, I, I was sharing a couple of uh, things with one of my dental assistants recently, and I use a water pick, and, and so they comment on it sometimes. Well, you know, you're lucky at your age. You don't have any plaque, but it's from that water pick and so on and so forth. And one of them said, I keep trying to get my husband. I convince him. And uh, so I was getting a cleaning, and she was flossing at the wrap-up. And she said, man, you don't hardly even bleed. Some people just bleed when I'm doing this, and you don't. And I said, because I turned my water pick on 10. My philosophy has always been, if you ain't bleeding when you're brushing, you ain't brushing right. And she started laughing. She said, here's me. And she described, she said, here's a big toothbrush. She said, here's me. Here's my husband. And I said, well, get with the program. He's cleaning his. He's getting everything out. You're just being dainty. Do, do you hold your finger up? Do, 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 do. It's like you might as well drink a glass of water. Those are the things we discover about our spouses after we marry. And sometimes you get to have that discovery for a long time. Seven years would be wonderful. By that time, you wouldn't care anymore about the little petty things. You'd let each person have their own uniqueness and their own personality, and it wouldn't matter to you because you wouldn't take it personally because usually it's not personal. It's just a matter of we didn't disclose these things before marriage because we didn't have a good opportunity to, and we didn't want you to see that it mattered that much. Oh, whatever you say, dear, before we're married. And then after we really are married, but what about me? What about my opinion? I want to do it this way. And so the conflict has begun. Now, the, the next dynamic is uh, uh, complicated because we never know when this one is coming. If it comes after seven years, wow, great. Of course, you'll be old when your kids are old. I mean, when they're 18, you'll be 80. But uh, most likely we marry somewhere in our early 20s or so, but if it's first marriage, and then a couple of three years later, we're where we think, you know, we're ready to have a child, we have a child. And I don't know about any of you watching but or here, but I will tell you that two or three years is uh, it's not enough time to really have worked out all your differences and nuances and conflicts, but it certainly is better than three or four months. And the only problem is sometimes it's three or four months into a marriage and we're already pregnant. Or sometimes we're pregnant the first week we get married 
and then a baby is coming in nine months. And, uh, and so we enter the, the next dynamic of marriage, and that is the dynamic of having children, which changes everything in a marriage. And we still haven't worked out our own uniqueness with each other and learned how to reconcile our differences with love, forgiveness, patience, and kindness. So we still, so, so we, we wind up pregnant, we wind up having a child, and we haven't reconciled all of our differences, and all of a sudden, once we have children, we're no longer husband and wife. We're just not. I mean, we are on paper, but we're mom and dad. We're parents. We even learn to call each other that. Oh, you want to go to mommy, mommy, mommy? Mom, daddy, take her, daddy, mommy, daddy. And then we start calling each other that. Mom, what you want? By the time they're 15, we don't even know our names anymore. I don't want to go ask your mom. And, and then, you know, I don't know how many times I heard, Dad, come here. And it's my wife. Will you tell these girls? Okay. And I have told my wife in those days, I ain't your daddy. That would be weird. I'm their daddy. But that's the identity you lose after the kids come along. Whether we like it or not, it's almost impossible for a married couple to maintain the same level of intimacy and travel and eating out and doing things together and coupling after you have a child. It's almost impossible. Because first year of that child's life, you can't really go anywhere without them. You got to take them. By the time you've done that for a year, you're accustomed to it. Uh, the, the laws were different. We didn't have to have a car seat for them. You just held them in the car. I don't know how they're still alive. The population of the world should have decreased by a half a generation ago, but it didn't. Amazingly, they all survived. When my uh, first daughter was cranky sometimes at night, when she's a year old, cranky and didn't want to go to sleep and a little colicky, I had learned that driving in the car would put her right to sleep. And I didn't have to do anything like, oh, hold on, I gotta get coats and car seats and some safety belts and harnesses. And, and uh, I just picked her up and I said to my wife, I'm gonna drive a block three times, I'll be back in a minute. Put her up on my shoulder, get in that big car with V8 engines, and back out. And all of a sudden she's already through crying, looking out the window, laying on my shoulder. I just cruised 10 miles an hour around the neighborhood. About the second block around, she's sound asleep. I cruise one more block, pull up in the driveway, ease out, nudge the door, go in. Hey, she's asleep. No law broken, nothing happening. And then that, you know, baby's asleep, yay, put her in the crib, yay. Why is the crib in our bedroom? Oh, I need to hear if she wakes up. Well, then we have to whisper, yes, we do. And then we can't make like, Cozy. No, we can't. I hate you. I don't want to be in this kind of marriage. I want my love life back. I want my intimacy back. I want sex. I don't want to just be daddy with a brat over there consuming my whole life. And it, and it doesn't change. They get out of the crib into their own car that you're having to pay for and provide insurance for and struggle to pay all the bills of kids and all the garbage they have to spend at school. And oh my God, they, have, they gotta have money every day for some new project and some new teacher's class and they gotta get in sports and band and they gotta have, oh my word. I, I have literally worked three jobs at a time to just try to make ends meet and keep kids happy. And when you're doing that, you don't have marriage anymore. You're a parent. The dynamic of having children changes the relationship you have with your spouse, and there's nothing you can do about it. That doesn't mean you can't still love and have intimacy and find ways to find time together, but boy, you have to have had a good first two years in order to do that when kids come along. Meaning you have to have enjoyed the discovery process and put all the pieces in the right place and still love that person intimately that's different than you are so that when the child comes along, now you still want to find times to be alone and intimacy and you'll find a babysitter and you'll make a mother-in-law keep that child 
just so you can have time together. That's ideal. That's not normal. That's abnormal. Because one, you enjoy the role of parent. I love my, I loved having kids and I love my life as a dad. And, and when she was just a few weeks old, uh, my wife was able to take off work for a while. I don't remember now. I want to say six weeks, maybe two months, uh, take off work. Now me, I like getting up at three o'clock when she cried in the morning and wanted her bottle. I like slipping out of bed. My wife would say, no, I would do it. You have to go to work. I don't care. I don't care. Get back to bed. And I'd get her and go to the rocking chair with a bottle and I'd rock her in the living room and I'd count her fingers and her toes and look at her and it was just wonderful. And then she'd go back to sleep. I'd burp her and make sure her diaper was okay or change it. I'd go back in and lay her in and go around and slip in the bed. And my wife would say, did you burp her? Oh, yeah. Did you check her diaper? Yeah. Did you change it? It didn't need it. Hey, are you sure? Oh, my God, I hate you. I didn't say that. But that she was just being a mother. She didn't get up and go that time. But she can't trust that the man is bright enough. He's so dumb about everything. He, he rolls the end of toothpaste, for God's sake. He just squeezes it. What does he know? Did you? Did you? Did you? And so you're just, that's where you're going to be now. You're going to be parent. Parent for a long, long time. You don't get a break from it. You have those darlings and you love them. And then they become so cuddly and then they love you and my daughters thought I was the smartest man in the world when they started school and they were in the first grade and they'd come home with questions like, why is the sky blue? Why are fire trucks red? And I could, I could bedazzle them. And they, they, they just, uh, they would sit there the first time one of them said, uh, fire trucks, they're always red, aren't they? They were then, they're yellow, some of them now. And I said, yeah, you know why? No, why? Well, because fire trucks have eight wheels and four men and eight and four is 12. 12 inches is a ruler. Queen Elizabeth was a ruler. Queen Elizabeth was the longest ship that sailed the sea. Fish live in the sea. Fish have fins. The fins thought the Russians, the Russians are red. Therefore, fire trucks are red. And they're like, how do you know all that stuff? I'm the smartest man in the world. And then they get in the third grade and they think you're too stupid to help with homework, which you kind of are. By the fifth grade, I couldn't help with homework anymore. It's a different way of working than me. And that consumes your life. You start getting consumed with their life. Their life takes predominance over yours. Rightfully so. You're a parent. You're obligated to look out for them. You've got to take care of them. You've got to protect them. You've got to feed them. You've got to take care of their school problems. You've got to clothe them. You don't have time to be building a marriage relationship. You better have done that in those first few years unless you didn't have time. You know, she had a baby the first few months, got pregnant in the first year, and then you really hadn't got adjusted to each other very well and forgiven each other for the false stories you kind of built up on. And so for, we'll just say for, we'll say for 18 years, optimistically speaking, like they're going to get out of the house at 18. No, they're not. They're going to go to college. You're going to pay for it. So when they're 22 years old, you can kind of say, I'm not a parent so much anymore but not really. That's the third dynamic. The third dynamic of marriage is when the children start leaving because you have just invested 18 years in becoming the person you were not when you married. When you married, you were a wife, intimate partner to a man. You were a husband, lover to a woman. And then a child came along and then maybe one, two, three more and you had to end the lover role, you're no longer suave, charming, you're no longer passing on cute and coy little things every night, maybe once a month when you're not dog tired and have to get sleep because you become a dad and a mom. <clears throat> and then you are that way if you just had one child for at least 18 years. If you had two, another one three years later, that's another 21 total years that you're, if you had three, then 24 or five years, you are still a parent to a child living in your house. And finally, one day, they used to call it the empty nest syndrome. 
when the last child finally moves out of the house. And uh, I'll just say, uh, empty nest or not, the dynamic of marriage goes through another major paradigm shift when the last child moves out. Even if they're not independent yet, even if they're just off at college, but they're all gone, the marriage dynamic changes one more time, another major paradigm shift. And here's how clever it is. When the last child finally leaves home, you don't know the person over there in that other recliner. They're not the person you met 22 years ago when you were trying to discover them in the first year or two after marriage. That person sitting over there 22 year later in, years later in the recliner next to you ain't the boy you married, ain't the woman you married, just not. And now you realize the kids are gone, and what am I going to do with him? And he's like, well, what's she going to do? We ain't never going to be 18 again and be whoopee. Let's go to bed at 8 o'clock. Nope, you'll go to bed at 8, not for that reason. You'll go because you've got to get up at 6 in the morning and go to work, and because you're simply worn out from 22 years of being daddy and mama and being broke most of those years. The average man in America never starts saving money until he's 45 years old. Isn't that shocking? You're 45 years old in America. The average man is 45 years old before he ever tries to have a savings account to actually save money in. 45. You know why? Because his kids are finally gone. I mean, it's just a simple dynamic. As long as you got kids, they take every dime you can make extra. When they got, I remember my, uh, it was a long time ago, so prices are so much bigger now, but I remember when both my girls were driving, when the second one caught up to the driving age, and I had two girls on my insurance, both girls increased my insurance $440 a month. And we're talking about many years ago, 20 some odd years ago, and both girls increased my insurance by $440 a month, a, a great number. I remember seeing it on the first bill that came in. And I said, what is this? And I called the agent and I said, are you kidding me? And he said, well, good news for you, Mr. Carpenter. Uh, it used to be boys cost more than girls on insurance. And uh, the, the, the tables have adjusted and girls have more wrecks than boys do now. And so the rates for girls have gone up. Lucky you, you got two girls. You get the highest rate of insurance for teenage girls. Well, thank you very much. Both my girls had wrecks while they were still in high school. And that increases it more. And then all of a sudden, finally, oh, glorious day. They won't ever watch this. They don't watch Dad's sermons. Oh, glorious day, they're gone. And then I'm saddled with another stranger, and she with me. Who is this woman? Well, she's actually better than the one I had when I married. I wouldn't tell her that. But she has been made better by the obligation of having to deal with kids and their life and their responsibility. She has learned how to be patient and kind and temperate. She has learned how to juggle figures and juggle lunches and juggle this and juggle that. And washing my few little clothes she washes is nothing compared to the clothes those kids went through every single day of their life and having to wash those. And so it's actually like, you know, you're sitting in two up recliners and the TV's on and you're thinking, I could probably like this woman. Too bad I didn't meet her 23 years ago. I'd have never married my wife if I'd have met her 23 years ago. I'd have married her. And then it dawns on you, oh, she is a different person. Not that she was bad then, but we really do benefit from having kids because we really do uh, ground ourselves in what really matters, and we become more temperate, moderate, patient, kind, organized, managerial. And, uh, and so you, now you've got the, this great paradigm shift, this, this third dynamic of it's just us now. And you've got to do the same thing you did 20-something years ago, and that is start discovering who this person is. The only good thing is, if you made it this far, there's no reason to quit now. You made it this far. Hang on. Don't quit. But then there's a rub. 
by the time the kids are gone, uh, by the time the kids are gone, uh, usually you've had to make all the money you can make during those years because they are expensive. And college is expensive if you're going to help them pay for it. And so you've had to work extra jobs. You've had to find out how to manage your money. You've done the best you can to make every dollar count. And the result is you have finally become, for lack of a better term, successful. Not that you weren't before, but now you got some money. And your kids, when they finally go out and you finally can breathe and you think, oh, what are we going to do with this extra $1,000 in the bank? Well, we might invest that. Because by this time, you're not into, oh, let's go buy a cool car. That was when you were 20. Now it's like, maybe we ought to open an IRA. Maybe we ought to start a savings account. We are, after all, 45 years old. Look, this month we got another thousand extra. What's, what's happening here? I may quit a second job, <laughs> whatever. But here's what happens in those middle years now when the kids have walked out of that house and I have to discover this other person over here and the dynamic has changed so much. We're not the same person. We were broke and scared and faking it when we were young and now we're not broke and we're not scared and we don't have to fake it. We've learned how to be a man and a woman. The problem is arguing over kids carried over because we still argued over stupid things before they came along and we never got all that resolved. So we've argued over them. What school? I don't care. Yes, I do. No, not that one. I don't want to spend that money. Not that kind of car. I'm not going broke. I'm not going to buy one. I'm not going to put it on notes. No, we will not do that. Can't do it. I'm not going to go there. All 20 years, 18 years of it. 20 if you had two or three. <clears throat> And here we are now. In your 40s, you have arrived in the world. Probably got a few promotions along the way on your job. Might even be a manager by the time you get in your 40s. Might be a supervisor. Might own your own business. Might even start realizing, man, if we put this much money aside every month, we might buy a little store, a business, a house, shopping center. Who knows? We might do anything. We can invest. We can make some money, and you do. And as you do, it still doesn't make you intimate with each other and pull you in. It just gives you a different bearing. You know you're successful. You've weathered the storms. You've survived everything. You walk taller. You stand taller. You got some prestige at work because, well, after all, you've been working there 25 years. You got promotions. You got money in the bank. You're not intimidated by anybody. You've been through kids, for God's sake. Surgeries, hospitals, blood on the floor, puke. God knows you've done it all. And you're accomplished and you're successful. But you look over at your wife and all you see is mom. And she looks over at you and all she sees is dad still arguing about the car prices with the kids and all that. And you go to work and there's some woman on the job who does not see you for all the things you did wrong for the last 25, 30 years. Doesn't see the time you couldn't pay the bills. Doesn't know that you ever missed the light bill and the lights got turned off. Doesn't know you ever argued over toothpaste or toilet paper or the price of kids' books these days or a car or insurance or boys they could date or anything else. All she sees you for is the successful man you have become. You walk different. You're confident. You know you can do anything you want to do. Put your mind to it, you can. You make a few investments, they do well. You got some money in the stock market. You got some in the bank. You're 45 years old. You're 48 years old. You have finally learned how to manage your money and manage yourself and your life. You get up in the morning, you put on nice clothes. You care about how they look. You take care of the things that you own and what you have. And it doesn't pay off at home. Because we don't sit around the house and say to our wife in our 40s after raising kids and mopping vomit off the floor and cleaning up mistakes and walking through fevered nights in hospitals. And you don't look over and say, ooh, you look nice today. We say, you feel all right today? Oh, I'm kind of hurting here. Yeah, that's what I thought. Me too. Well, have a nice day. Okay, you too. 
But then when you get out and away and you go, you're not around people who you help clean up with and you know, all the problems you walk in and somewhere somebody sees you for the human you have become, not for the man or woman you used to be. And the most vulnerable time for what we think is a successful marriage to end is after the kids are gone and we're grown-ups. And I'd use that word loosely, discovering the grown-up. I mean discovering the man or woman who has simply become confident because they have a little bit of money in the bank. They have discovered how to invest some of it. They know what to do. They know where they're going. They don't, they're, they're absolutely uh, impenetrable. They're like a fortress. They're sheltered. They're strong. They're not afraid of anything in business or in life. And nobody cares and nobody notices that except somebody. Somebody does. But it's usually not the husband or the wife. And there's the most vulnerable time in a marriage is the person who comes along and says, oh my gosh, I wish my first husband had been like you. I wish I'd have met you when I was younger. And you know, no, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have liked you any more than what your name does or his name. But those, those things are so forgotten by the time you've had a kid for 22 years, you can't even remember your own blunders and mistakes 22 years ago when you spent those last 22 years with a kid. And someone somewhere will admire you for the person you have become. It would be wonderful if that admiration came from your wife or from your husband. And sometimes it does. A wise couple can do it, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it comes from someone else. And they just admire you, and you love it. It feels good to be recognized for what I've become and not punished for what I used to be. And the greatest temptation any married man or woman will usually face if they make it that long is discovering that I'm not the person I was when I married. It, rightfully so, and good. You're smarter, better, wiser, more managerial, more money, and you know how to dress and act and walk and talk. And you are. If you were available out there in the pond, you're a great catch for somebody but you're not available. You're in a contract, a long-term commitment, and it's gonna be hard to stay with it if in those years and in that dynamic, you forget how important you're supposed to be to each other, that you're supposed to see, look at the man he has become. Look at the woman she has become. Not just, you know, not just, Oh, I love you because you've been a good mother to our kids. Nah, oh, we're still mother and father as long as we live and they live, but you don't care for them anymore. And they don't need you like they used to need you. And that's the next dynamic. Dynamic of health and money is not like we were just talking about, you finally make it. No, this is when you start realizing kids are all married and grown. They don't come around much anymore. And right now, in our 50s and 60s, you know what occupies us? No, money, we just need something to be able to die on. And it looks like we're going to die sooner than we thought because my health is failing. Nobody is here to live forever. We are dying on the day we're born. We're never built. God didn't design us to last forever. We're, we're going to live to be whatever age we are, and very few of us are going to see 100, if at all. 101, 102, that's rare. 95, in good health, impossible. My mom was 97, I believe, when she died. Not in good health. I mean, her body was strong, but 14 years she spent, the last 14 years, Alzheimer's, dementia, we had a don't resuscitate order on there, and it got so bad that she got the flu, and they said, we're not going to give her anything for it. We're just going to help her rest. Call the family. You'd be prepared. She's got the flu. Mom beat the flu with no medication. The next year, she got the flu, beat it again. Because one time, I said, your mom has pneumonia in both lungs. The doctor came and looked at her today. She's got pneumonia in both lungs. Now, we have, you know, our paperwork here says just keep her comfortable and help her not be in pain. Yeah, that's pretty much where she is. She doesn't know anything, doesn't know anything. 
didn't know how to use a bathroom, didn't know how to get dressed. Every day was a new day. Somebody had to tell her everything to do. She beat pneumonia twice. Her body was strong as far as overcoming things. That's it. And uh, every single one of us is going to experience the description of old age in the book of Ecclesiastes. The almond tree is going to flourish. That means turn white. Those that look out of windows are going to grow dim. That's your eyes. The grinders are going to cease. That's your teeth. You're going to lose them. They're going to fall out. You're going to have to have false ones or implants. The keepers of the house will tremble, Ecclesiastes says. That's these right here. I had a rent car for the last week. It's a brand new Toyota Cam Camry. Is that what they're called? Camry. Brand new Toyota Camry. Had 19 miles on it when they brought it to me to, to drive for a week. I hate that thing. You know, I hate no, no, Toyota Camry's beautiful cars. Love them. Great cars. It really is a wonderful car. You know why I hated it? I couldn't get out of it. I'm used to my tall SUV. I just slide my legs over and stand up. That's nice. You see, I'm sitting on a stool, not a low chair. The lower I sit, the longer it takes me to rise. And when I'm sitting in that little car with my legs out here in front of me, and I'm down at the ground, and I got to just turn over, and the ground's right there, I got no support. I just have to grab something and grunt. Uh, uh. The keepers of the house tremble. And that's what Ecclesiastes, that's what he's writing, is a description of every human being. We don't like it when it starts coming, but it's going to come to every one of us. And then the dynamic starts changing one more time. If you survive that midlife crisis where, you, where someone else admires you more than you can admire each other, and you still survive that and come through it and learn how to respect each other and admire each other, then the next paradigm shift for you is your health will fail, and one of you will wind up being a caregiver to the other. And it's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's not a joy. You no longer even never passes your mind. Ooh, remember the intimacy of the young day? Nope. That's not a factor anymore. Factor now is comfort. Keep us alive. Try to provide the needs. Bring some food. Take care of this. Take care of that. And if you get through that paradigm shift at the end, the last one that we finish life on is uh, coming to the end of our importance. Because everyone, if you live long enough, will reach a place where you realize nobody really needs me anymore. And nobody cares about my opinion. And if I try to give it the chuckle behind my back, say, that's an old man, just ignore him. God bless him. Our search for significance starts in our early years, and we want to experience it in our mate. We want our mate in our 20s to think that we're somebody and admire us, admire me, and brag on me. Oh, you look beautiful. Oh, you're so hot. That dress is awesome on you. Oh, you're such a wonderful man. I'm so glad I married you. That's great. That's great. That's great. And then when you come to those last years, you want a sandwich? I'm making one for me. You know... I think I'm just going to suck on a sock in here, if you don't mind. I get more comfort out of a sock right now, dirty or clean. No, thank you. What? No, thank you. We're not even significant to each other sometimes when we come to the end of life. But that's the way it's going to be. You're going to go through six major paradigm shifts in marriage and if you know that ahead of time and you're willing to say, I'm in this till death do us part, if I have to burp you when you're young or old, I'm going to do it because I love you. We'll work all these little details out. Then you can have what I said at the beginning. You can have a long, I wish I'd put O's in there. You can have a long marriage. It'll be happy sometimes. It won't be happy other times. It'll be sad. It'll be joyful. It'll be just like Ecclesiastes. There'll be a time to dance, be a time to mourn. There'll be a time to bury and a time to plant and give birth. That's life. Life is always a juxtaposition of sweet and bitter. And marriage doesn't change that. It's just that you get a partner to do it with. If you make it work, then you fulfill another verse in Ecclesiastes, and that's this. It's better for two to walk together than for one to walk alone, husband and wife. 
Because if two are walking together, one's going to fall. He doesn't say that. He says, if the one falls, he has the other to pick him back up again. And if that's the description of your marriage, you're a lucky man or a woman. If it's not, make that your goal. Make that your goal in marriage to be that kind of partner. We're going to walk through this life together. One of us is going to fall today. The other one might fall tomorrow. But every time one of us falls, it's the other one who's going to reach down and say, come on back up here and let me help you. And we're going to encourage each other through every dynamic change of marriage in Christ's name, I hope that your marriage, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. God bless you.